I don't know what I feel. I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. There's not a sense of belonging, for me in particular. I don't feel as if I own this or I'm part of this. I see colonisation, that's what I see when I see the Union Jack. I think there is a section of society that would identify me as Black British, but I've got a lot of experience of people asking me, um, you know, things like how long I've been in Britain. Despite, you know, I speak quite good English, I, you know, people still do just think black first. There was black in the, union, in the Union Jack, very much so. There was a lot of black in the Union Jack. I mean, without, without black, there would be no Britain. Without that slavery, there'd be nothing. My name is Delano. I'm a 24-year-old musician and filmmaker currently studying archaeology and anthropology at the University of Bristol. Back in 2013, I made a short spoken word film for a project entitled Race Through the Generations. So to elaborate, I split it in two, three sections. That's your heritage, culture and skin complexion. There is Black in the Union Jack is the latest project from Black Southwest Network. And in the spring of 2017, workshops took place at the Junction 3 Library. People engage with Dr. Edson Burton and Dr. Madge Dresser, looking at how the question of identity in a post-Brexit society has changed and perceptions of progression within the city. There is Black in the Union, Jack. We'll see how people in Bristol feel about this statement today. The rhyme was, there ain't no Black in the Union, Jack, send those niggas back. That was the rhyme. Yeah, that was the rhyme for us when we, that was the rhyme in the 70s. That's how it went. There ain't no Black in the Union, Jack, send those niggas back. That's the full title. Well, it's how you determine kind of the Union Jack. The Union Jack symbolises, you know, the United Kingdom. So in terms of there is black in the United Kingdom because they are uh, different black and minority ethnic communities. I'm a big fan of Paul Gilroy's work, so I've of course read There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, but you know, that's the thing with Gilroy's work is that actually there is and there always has been. Black people, BME people, BAME people have been foundational to this country for centuries and centuries. This country wouldn't exist without us. Is there black in the Union Jack? Of course, there has to be. The skills, the knowledge, the effort, the energy, the intellect, from people of all colors, especially black, also went into the formation of not just the United Kingdom, but also the United Kingdom and its Commonwealth. Britain was an empire, and its empire took control of countries with vast portions of people of color in them. Um, you know, Britain has almost no resources to have funded such an empire uh, at the time, particularly when it started. They was getting their resources from somewhere else. Well, the Union Jack is a flag that's a symbol of, of British imperialism because you didn't get the um, uh, United Kingdom until 1801 with the colonization of uh, Ireland. And it's, of course, a white story. It's very Eurocentric. But actually, when you look at Britain, particularly in the 18th century, which I studied a lot, the whole, the whole greatness of Britain, the expansion of the Navy, that song, We Shall Never, Never, Never Be Slaves, was all about conquering the Atlantic and the beginnings of global global economy that was based on the exploitation of African labor and enslaved African labor. The European concept of race gained significance in the 18th and 19th centuries with the rise of European colonization. Whilst an individual's self-identity is usually quite complex, social identity tends to boil down to basic visual signifiers such as race and gender. We ask people how they identify themselves and how does society identify them. I would say right, I have a multi-dimensional identity, yeah. right? And in some sense, when, if you ask me who I am, it depends, right? So I'm my father, husband, brother, sister, and all those types of things, yeah. that's real. Yeah. Um, but clearly there's a racial dynamic to me as well. So what am I? I'm, I'm black, African heritage, mixed race. I use all these terms, and in some sense, it depends on where I am and who I'm talking to, as according to which term, uh, term I use. It's important I say I'm mixed race as well, because 
that's my identity, right? I have Welsh and English, white English and Welsh blood coursing through my veins, and that is who I am, and I don't deny that. Yeah. Uh, deny that heritage, no more. But what I would also say is, I've just said this morning actually at a talk, when I revel in my Welshness, it doesn't take away from my Englishness. Reveling right. in my Englishness does not take away from my Jamaicanness or my Africanness. Right. And that doesn't take away from any other identity. Yeah. They are all true at the same time. My gran would consider, she always considered herself British because she, you know, she was all, so it's funny how identity changes because she was, came to England before Jamaica had its independence and she was always strongly of the view that she was British. But my parents, were always identified as Jamaican and I guess up until I was about 14 I just saw myself as part of a, a Jamaican family living here despite the fact I was born here and I clearly I, I can clearly remember when I thought I identified with Bristol and this was my home was St Paul's Carnival night 1984 85 massive attack were playing and they were playing every different type of music reggae to punk um, and I, at that point, I remember thinking that, that I kind of understood that this is where I'm from. Of course, I consider myself British Somali, I'd say, because although I was brought up in Somali customs and I was brought up as a Muslim, I was also brought up in Britain, which made up a huge part of my own identity. So I think it's a mixture of both. For me, I would identify myself as being uh, black British, um, but more specifically Caribbean um, and African because I'm 50-50 split. Um, I'm a woman. Um, I would say I'm very queer in my outlook. Um, I think that there are lots of things about the queer environment um, and community that allow me to feel like I can say what I want, how I like to say it. Actually feels like it combines a lot of my black culture, um, my individual personality, um, and then my love of things that are just very radical and a bit different. Where are you from? I'm from London. No, no, where are you really from? I'm really from London, you know. Um, where are your parents from? Well, my dad's from Kenya. My mum's from Yemen. Uh, my grandparents were, were, bo were born in India. I guess if I, like, on those equality monitoring forms that we always have to fill out, uh, I guess I'm British, Asian, Indian is probably the closest approximation. But the really, really interesting thing that happened for me last year in the run up to the referendum was I finally felt British because I finally felt like this was a country I want to fight for because I do not like the way it's going. I love being British, living in England. I enjoy that and, and, and I define myself as British, but at the same time I also move to a place where my African is very strong and I engage with that and I, and I, I don't want to lose that. How do I identify myself is a really difficult question because I recognise those external societal ascriptions of identity to myself, I recognise that the markers in me that contribute to that identification are real in, in the sense of you know my background my education is very kind of stereotypically middle class um, obviously i'm white in terms of those racial categorizations i'm male um, and i'm heterosexual so so but but do i identify as white and middle class according to the sort of cultural values that are associated with those or, or the underlying um, ideologies that go with those, I, I, would, I would suggest not. It's easier to identify yourself as African than it is Scottish if you look like the way I look. So um, to be quite frank, I mean, it's impossible for someone who's mixed race to actually identify with a specific um, identity in terms of African because of course Africans will see you as um, British and then British will see you as African so it's quite a difficult position to be in. It's really so hard to put into words. I feel in a lot of ways really American even though I haven't lived there for almost half of my life now. But I think when you live in a different country, you really are aware of the ways in which your nationality and your national upbringing shapes you. But I do identify really strongly as a colonized person and a, marginalized, a person from a marginalized background and a person of color. I think in my regular life, I feel quite comfortable with who I am. I think it's one of the privileges of working in a university system, which isn't to say there's not racism here because there is all over the place. but it's generally a lot easier to move around. So I 
describe myself as Black, African, Caribbean, British, Queen's Park. We who grew up in Queen's Park know and understand each other and those varieties and stuff. So I realised in different spaces, I, I feel the difference of being in different other, other black communities and so on. The things where people aren't joined up, the conversations that they have, certain antagonisms that might exist. I tell you why I self-identified as when I was told what I should be self-identified as. So I was, was half-caste. I was a half-breed, red-skinned, a red man, yeah, black. There are all the different ways that I was taught to identify myself to. I go through a whole journey with my identity. It started off, I didn't even recognise it, it meant nothing to me until, what was it, 1980, 1981, Roots come out. I remember going to school. That day I walked into school the next day. It was straight, what are you? Mm. And what do you mean, what am I? And it was, are you black or are you white? And it was like, ah. Because I guess my friends, they'll just see me as just a guy. Whereas my family, you know, they may just see me as a, you know, young Somali male. And maybe in other situations, they may just see me as a young black male and not maybe take into account that I'm Somali or, you know, so I think with identity, it's who you are, but it also changes according to who you're around. When you, you criticise the UK for, uh, because you want it to be better, you want it to do better, and then the trolls are like, I'd much rather you just go back to where you came from, actually. Um, and why don't you fix your problems in your own country and you go, well, I was born here. And they go, that doesn't mean you're British. And I think that's really interesting. Society will identify me as black. Mm -hmm. um, some society will. And when I was a kid, you know, we're being frank on here, right? It wasn't unusual for guys to drive past us in the cars and shout niggers and so forth, right? That's, that's, that was a reality of life in 1980s Bristol, yeah. even into the 90s, right? And that was real. What I do experience in politics this is a strange world I live in now. That I think some people will identify me um, as working class yeah. by heritage. I, sometimes I meet people, even in this world I'm in now, people, even some of the people who profess to be the activists, and I think they're quite posh people. <laughs> and they're quite, and I find them quite sometimes quite snooty towards me. In terms of um, how society see me. I would say um, black, male, mostly educated, um, and it, all of those depend on what levels of interaction, what depth of interaction occur, so that um, fear response is often based on not really knowing me very much, um, the whole stereotyping of being black and being male. Um, in terms of educated certain contexts, but nonetheless, I would say that I'm patronized on a daily basis. Um, and sometimes it's amusing, sometimes it's annoying. Um, <laughs> um, and, but also that actually, that becomes, that has its own alienating tool. So I grew up quite working class. Um, I interact with quite a widespread of people. And it often means that my personal sense of self, and personal identity and where I personally identify is not where people think I'm at. I guess I'm at the age now, the only important thing is where I self-identify. And, um, and that I'm quite strong, I, I am who I am. And if you don't like it, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really bother me. I watched a video the other day on Nanny of the Maroons and she was fighting against the British. That is my heritage. So if my heritage or my ancestors were fighting against the British, how can I then be British? That don't make no sense. So what happened here last year, 10th of July? So last year, uh, me alongside a couple other people based in Bristol, we organized a Black Lives Matter march yeah. um, as almost like a tribute to like the appalling images that we've all seen online of Alton Sterling being almost kind of like viciously almost executed in this car, you know? And I kind of put up a Facebook post and I was just initially asking all Bristol artists to come together and kind of like unite and see if we can create some kind of song or some kind of creative kind of thing to help, you know, just pay tribute. And then it kind of moved on to a different thing where um, I kind of felt that like we could come together and unite and actually like put on a march. We are strong people. 
We are intelligent people. We are tough people. We are mighty people. We are a passionate people. And we are people who are tired of being killed for no reason. I kind of feel like like our black brothers and sisters in the, like in America, like those are those, you know like we're all part of like the same the same the same larger community, global community, you know? Like most of what they face over there we face over here as well. Because of my situations in my life at that moment, you know, like I had to kind of take myself away from it um, just for the fact that I was kind of a bit overwhelmed with it. I didn't expect, um, you know, like the hype to be that intense, you know, like I loved it and I, and, I, and I embraced it and I engaged in it. But I just think me at that point, I just had to take myself away for a little bit just okay. to reflect. And, like, and like I was kind of just paying tribute to everybody else around the UK and in America, like doing the same similar thing, you know. And um, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really like get too, too deep into like the politics behind the actual yeah. Black Lives Matter. But I just took from it what I seen fit as to take. It's almost like a tree; you just pick like the nice ripe bits. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You get yeah. the seeds and you plant, a, you plant hopefully like a better one. When do we want justice? When do we want it now? Black Lives Matter. According to a report by Ronnie Mead from the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity. Bristol is ranked 7th out of 348 districts of England and Wales, with rank 1 being the worst. For black people, Bristol has the third highest level of educational inequality in England and Wales. How do institutions affect this? And does institutional racism and white supremacy factor into these statistics? The term white supremacy often conjures up images of clansmen in white hoods with burning crosses. However, the most dangerous white supremacists are the ones working in banks and schools, denying business loans and treating melanated children differently. There is a lot of structural racism that needs to be dismantled, a lot of institutional racism. I think, um, I know it always seems really, really flippant for me to say, but um, I think there is an issue about representation that is so core to who we are as people in this country. So like when we see ourselves in books and TV and films and we're not just the sidekick and we have names and we're part of the action, you know, like John Boyega in the Star Wars film or Riz Ahmed in Rogue One. If we see ourselves reflected back in these universes, it, it raises our aspiration levels. It gives us role models to aspire to be. From institutions such as like the police, school, education, like even rocking up to hospital, even rocking up to a job interview, you know, like, it's just this skin I wear, it's just this personality I wear, like, it's, it's, you know, like, to everyone else, it's black. Like, the whole facial expressions, the whole shoulders, the whole, just everything, yeah. it just, everything just yeah. changes, you know? Yeah. 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 But I've learned, just like my grandparents, just like my parents, just like every other black person that I've met, that's from inner city, you know, like, you just have to just deal with it, you just gotta just, Picking up that skin and just take it, you know what I mean? For a black child, the first time that you know for, for certain, without a doubt, that you're different is like almost that first day of school. You know, so much is defined by the teacher. And I think in the 80s, for example, like Jesus Christ, absolutely devastating sometimes, the response that teachers would have towards me. I mean, I think for me, definitely the university. I work in a university. The majority of my friends work in universities. Um, a lot of my social networks have come through different connections I've made with the university. So I think that's an institution that's affected my social identity tremendously. I think, I don't know that I'd call it an institution, but I think living in Easton has really affected my social identity in a very positive way. The local authority needs to reflect the city and it really hasn't. You've had, you know, kind of in terms of diversity, Women is not a, a, an issue. I think we've got significant amount of women now this year, particularly in the Labour group uh, and across the council anyway. I think in the, ex in, in the experience that I have had, when I'm in a boardroom, when I'm with the royal family, when I'm in the streets in Bristol, when I'm wherever I might be, people normally want your intellect, your knowledge, your experience more than your primary characteristics. I know that's not true for everybody, so I will acknowledge that. In 2016, the UK voted to leave the EU. Since this happened, there has been a significant rise in racially motivated hate crime. Many believe that this is due to the tone surrounding the referendum, one of fear of migrants and pseudo-British identities. How did this vote affect Bristol's BME population? 
<laughs> yeah, the day after Brexit, I was walking literally crossing the road just behind the building and um, a man a man screamed out the window, go home and, and the N-word, you know, that was the next, that morning after I woke up crying on my floor, that's what, that's what happened. So I just think, you know, give them their space, you know, and I think that for me personally, that's kind of the problem is that we don't really... We're not giving anyone space to express any of these particular points of view. I do fear some of the thoughts behind Brexit. Um, you know, I, I understand that it's not all about being racist, but I think what's happened is there's a lot of uneducated people who are using it as an opportunity to express their racist views. I've known it from my youth. They've always said there's no black in the Union Jack. You see what I'm saying? Um, so realistically, this is of course Britain. So obviously we have to either, we have to put our mark on Britain or leave. 500 years ago, go and find me a reference to race. Just go and find me someone. It don't exist. Corizoid, Negroid, Mongoloid, Australoid. We've invested too much in the wrong things. Race, religion, identity. Yeah, all lies. Boy, don't mean, don't mean nothing to me because we ain't no black in no Union Jack. People might think there's black in the Union Jack. You might want to try and paint a picture of there's black in the Union Jack. But for me, there ain't no black in the Union Jack. We just here to serve these people, yeah? That's how I see it. When you can serve a purpose for these people, you are British. When you serve no purpose for these people, you are from where your parents came from. Yes, we do have people moving over or out and um, moving forward if you will but then if you compare that to the numbers of actually the people who are stationary in where they are or potentially moving backwards you know it's very small numbers so whether i generally see as, as moving forward i think yes but not enough black people are suffering 10 times worse than white communities because we have the issue of race to be compounded with and prejudice and discrimination uh, and then compounded on top of that, you know, you can be you can be a black woman, lesbian, all of those other issues that come and compound us. I think it's okay to be black in Bristol. I don't think it's as bad as other parts where you live out on the sticks and you're black or you're, or should I say you're brown. You know, because once you're in a community where there's a lot of people of colour, you kind of blend in. And I don't really plan to spend the rest of my life here. I think I can do better elsewhere within my, my mother's country. I, you know, I, my focus is, is uh, as evidenced, I guess, by the, the, the PhD, is I guess trying to work with white people to wake them up to the realities of themselves and, and our society and, and, and our responsibilities. And that is a struggle. Yeah. That is a fight. Because most white people don't want to engage with that, not in any kind of real sense. I think the most important thing to learn about is oneself and the things that you are innately interested in, the things that drive you, that interest you, and that can only be done by exploration and self-reflection and being strong enough to say, I don't have to follow the crowd in that direction. I can remember times when the crowd were telling me that the things I was doing were totally wrong because black people didn't do that or women didn't do that or whatever didn't do that. Um, and I think it is about connecting with yourself to enable yourself to have the best life ever, the best chances ever, the best opportunities ever. It's clear that most people have differing views about belonging to this country. From the election of BME mayors in London and Bristol and Colson Hall's name change, to the Brexit vote and rising xenophobia on the international political stage, the UK sits at a crossroads in identifying as a nation what British heritage means and who fits into the ideology. While symbolic indicators of progress hold value, the pervasive reality of structural racism and white supremacy demonstrate that we still have a long way to go. When Britain felt and heard command, a world strong as the eyes of men, a world, a world, a world strong as the eyes of men. This was the Tatar. The charter of the land and the guardian age.